Good evening and welcome. Bethel is an inclusive faith community seeking to transform lives by exemplifying the unconditional love of Jesus. We extend a cordial and heartfelt welcome to all who join us in worship today in person, via Zoom or live stream. Welcome to those new to the Christian faith, those who are longtime followers of Christ, as well as those who are just curious about faith in Christ. To our friends who are without a church home and to those visiting with friends and family from another faith community. To those who need strength, want to follow Jesus Christ, have doubts or do not yet believe. To people of every color, culture, sexual orientation, gender identification, economic background, age, size, ability, and challenges. Old friends and new guests. To the old and the young, believers and questioners, and questioning believers. We welcome you to worship God with us on this day. Uh, an announcement for us here, come join us for caroling on Saturday, December 23rd at 6 p.m. We will meet at Carl and Louise's home and then we will go to Justin and Roxy's at 7 p.m. Let us lift spirits in song and love this Christmas season. And now we're going to direct our attention to the Advent wreath as we celebrate the third Sunday of Advent. We're lighting three candles today. Uh, we're trying to light three candles today. We'll come back to you. That's a stubborn candle. Oh, it's lit. Yay. <laughs> Let's pray. Blessed are you, God, God of might and majesty, for your promise to make the desert rejoice and blossom, to watch over strangers, and to set prisoners free. As we light these three candles, satisfy our hunger with your gracious gift. Open our eyes to all you have done for us, and fill us with patience and commitment until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And may the peace of our Lord be with each and every one of you. And also with you. Please join us in singing, I Trust in God. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fire Time after time Born of His Spirit Washed in His blood And what He did for me on Calvary Is more than enough I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. God will never fail. I trust in God, my Savior.
The scripture reading is from Isaiah 2. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. You, Lord, have abandoned your people, the descendants of Jacob. They are full of superstitions from the east. They practice divination like the Philistines and embrace pagan customs. 
Their land is full of silver and gold. There is no end to their treasures. Their land is full of horses. There is no end to their chariots. Their land is full of idols. They bow down to the work of their hands, to what their fingers have made. So people will be brought low and everyone humbled. Do not forgive them. Go into the rocks, hide in the ground from the fearful presence of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty. The eyes of the arrogant will be humbled and human pride brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. The Lord Almighty has a day in store for all the proud and lofty, for all that is exalted, and they will be humbled. For all the cedars of Lebanon, tall and lofty, and all the oaks of Bashan, for all the towering mountains and all the high hills, for every lofty tower and every fortified wall, for every trading ship and every stately vessel. The arrogance of man will be brought low and human pride humbled. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day and the idols will totally disappear. People will flee to caves in the rocks and to holes in the ground from the fearful presence of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty when he rises to shake the earth. In that day, people will throw away to the moles and bats their idols of silver and idols of gold, which they made to worship. They will flee to caverns in the rocks and to the overhanging crags from the fearful presence of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty when he rises to shake the earth. Stop trusting in mere humans who have but a breath in their nostrils. Why hold them in esteem? Here ends the reading. So as Lisa was reading the text, I was like, oh man, that second half is so a downer. <laughs> So much of a downer from the first half of the lesson that she, you know, the, the temple will be built on a high mountain. Let's pray. God, we thank you for, um, we thank you for the opportunity to gather and worship, whether in person or via Zoom. And we, we come into this place. We've gathered in this place together in your name to worship you. And so we invite your presence, we invite your spirit to be with us in all that we say and do, in the prayers, in the, in the songs, in the message, in the greetings that we exchange. We invite your presence to be here with us. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Tell me if you remember the, where this comes from. Could it be, who knows, there's something to anything I will know right away, soon as it shows. It may be a cannonballing down from the sky. Who knows? It's just out of reach, down the block, on a beach, under a tree. Any one of you? I got a feeling there's a miracle going to come true, coming to me. Could it be? You recognize the words of that song? It's from the opening song of Leonard Bernstein's hit Broadway show, West Side Story, something's coming, something's coming. Those words catch the spirit really of the Advent season and Isaiah's grand vision that Lisa just read for us, this vision of peace on earth. And when I read the text, I said, oh my God, that's what we need in our world today, this vision of peace on earth. Isaiah believed with all of his heart that God would one day bring about a world where all of humankind would live together. All of humankind would walk together in faith and in peace. Such a grand vision has really been, I think, the prayer of many people of faith throughout the generations. And I know it's definitely my prayer for the world today. Isaiah wrote these words when the people of Israel were weary of blood wars with Syria. And how ironic that this text still could apply today where the people of Israel are at war. And it looked as if the nation was condemned to an awful battle after battle until all of humanity would be ultimately destroyed. That's the writing in the text. And the people of God in the other age took heart from these exact words, even today, whether it's the people of Israel or the people of America or the people in Ukraine, they're taking comfort from these exact words, that the promise that this kingdom 
But there'll be an earth where there'll be no more wars. My adult Christmas wish, the words of that song. I pray that there'll be no more wars. A time when God's rule over all of the world would be supreme. God's rule and not human rule. God's rule and not a rule by an evil spirit. That God's love and grace and compassion would be what drives us in the world when Christ would return into power. In the face of the bloody persecution and the hardship, that real vision that Isaiah wrote about kept those early Christians going. The vision of a peaceful world, the vision of a place where there's no more starvation, no more homelessness, no more people being trafficked for selling their bodies. That vision, hold that vision in your head. And like Isaiah of old, they stood on their tiptoe believing that God would cause something tremendous, something fabulous to happen. Something's coming, like the words of the song. Isaiah pictured the Lord house as on this mountaintop. In fact, those are the exact words that Lisa read for us. With the world's nation streaming toward that mountain, beating swords into plowshares and spears beaten into pruning hooks, God's people in every age have strained their eyes toward that mountain. If you've ever been to Israel on the horizon, something's coming. The Dome of David, when you stand on certain elevations in Israel, you can see the Dome of David. You're looking for the hope. Something's coming. But honestly, the skeptic in me, and maybe the skeptic in you, laughs at such dreams sometimes. Sometimes I laugh at those hopes, even though I know that I'm looking forward to this significant event, this hope, this passion. And maybe I laugh in those situations where I'm just overwhelmed by the negative news that's on the television, that's in the papers, that's on the internet, that's on social media. Expecting daily lives to change. Expecting parents find absolute joy in what? Waiting for that child to be born, assembling that crib, painting that nursery, practicing all of the nice things that you're going to say to your child. Residents in a town that's expecting a dignitary or an official or, or president, they start to clean their yards and paint the statues that are filled with graffiti, and they do that when you're expecting something. There are certain things that we do when we're expecting something. A congregation in transition without a pastor gets excited when that pastor is about to be called. Even in the coming of Christmas, as we approach it, what's, what's today, the 15th, 16th? What day is it? 17th, eight days. <laughs> Lost track. Eight days to Christmas. People during that time of expectancy, you, you see it every year. It's like a light bulb turns on in people's hearts and their minds. People start speaking to you. Hi, how you doing? Have a happy day. You know, it's like, where is that all year round? Where is it? But we're expecting something. We're expecting something. And the world may not even know what Advent is. The world may not even know, or a large percentage of people in the world may not even know when Advent begins. But they're expecting something this time of year. This joke is told of a high school teacher who was in the barber shop just before Christmas. And he had a, a discussion with the barber about how much the kids looked forward to. They were expecting their Christmas vacation. He said, yes. And you should have heard and seen the excitement last day of school. There was foot stomping and back slapping and, and table pounding and singing and shouts of joy. And all of that was just from the teacher's lounge. <laughs> 
We get excited when we're expecting something. Yes, we all know the excitement that a future possibility can bring in our daily lives. But if we're honest, and I'm being honest here, we have also experienced loss. A few of us earlier were talking to Pastor Henry about the blue Christmas service that they're having here. We've also experienced disappointment over hope for a future that doesn't come. Is there anyone who has not known the emptiness, the emptiness of despair and of heartache when nothing happens? Despite all of our preparation, when nothing happens, the young couple who desperately tries to conceive a child, but it's all in vain. The town prepares for the celebrity visit, but the celebrity decides to go to another town because she has a better offer. For many people, even Christmas Day brings mixed feelings. The joy of opening the Christmas, but then after that, what happens? The beautiful packages are open, gifts are admired, and then they're put away. Trees come down, shepherds and angels are stored away for yet another year. The long-awaited day seems to pass so quickly with a sense of what happened. How did it happen so fast? We waited so long for this, and it went that fast. God's people have always had to live in our eyes fixed on hope. It's not a false expectation, but our eyes fixed on hope, hope for the future. And that's where I find myself, and that's where this text finds us. For people in Isaiah's time, the vision of this coming Messiah, it really sounded beautiful. The only ones who came were the Assyrians, not the Messiah. And the Persians with their armies, the early Christians were, they prayed fervently, like you and I. They prayed for the Lord to return. Come, Lord Jesus, is one of the prayers that's found in the scripture. But Roman soldiers came, not the Christ in power, not the Christ in glory. And for many today, the vision of God's wondrous return is kind of like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? They have no expectations of that. Where is this day that Paul says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord? Where is this beautiful God-shaped future when we seem to be sinking in the ocean? Where is it? It's the question that Isaiah would ask. Where is this God-shaped future when human greed is like a bottomless pit? Where is it? When we see those things around us, we can ask, where is it? Where is this time of strife-torn war where spears will become pruning hooks? Where is it? And swords will become plowshares. I think we try to keep light of the despair and the hopelessness in the world. Yes, we try to make light of it, of the world's greed and godlessness. But something has to happen. Something has to happen to change it around. Is this vision of a kingdom of God on earth just a fantasy? Maybe we can think about that this week. If it is, then the church of Jesus Christ is just another well-meaning institution in our society that's kind of whistling hymns in the dark, collecting people's pledge cards, passing out offering plates. Is it like that? Expecting nothing to happen? Nothing to change? Or is there really hope? Isaiah was no dreamer. And I don't think people of faith in every age have found hope in the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God ruling God's world. Ending wars and bringing peace. Not through the wave of a hand. 
that's not how I envision that in happening. You know how I envision that ha happening? Through you and through you and through you and all of you that are on Zoom and through me. God uses us as instruments to bring about the transformation that's needed in our small world. And then the people that we are able to touch and impact in our world can move and expand and touch people in their world. I don't have this grand vision of God doing snapping a finger or waving a wand and changing things, but I have a vision of God using you and me to transform this world. Isaiah reminds us first that the promised kingdom of God will come in all of its fullness in God's time. It will not come on a way of the denominations timetable. It won't come based on what a nation's power structure is or economic structure is. It won't come on that. Isaiah saw Jesus foretell a future so magnificent and far beyond anything you and I can even imagine but happening in God's time, and God using you and me to bring that about, to bring about the harmony and peace and the goodwill. Are you prepared for the something that's happening? The something that's coming? Isaiah's words really remind us of something else to be celebrated on this Sunday, this Advent Sunday. God is calling us, each and every one of us, to live today in the light of God, to live today in a way where we usher in, bring forth that peace and that hope that can be contagious to the world, that the world so desperately need. God is calling you and me to do that, to be Light. Let our little light shine. That's what God is calling. Don't let Satan blow it out. But letting your light shine. In the midst of all the darkness and evil and hatred and violence and sin and racism and sexism and war and murder that's going on in the world, I guess we have an option. We always have an option. We can choose to participate. We can choose to further that. Or you and I can make a conscious decision and say, I want to be the change that I want to see in the world. Every time a congregation like ours create a food pantry, clothing distribution, we do so not in some naive hope that a few cans of soup and an old suit or old jacket or old blouse or old shirt will solve all of human needs. But we do so in light of that great banquet table in heaven. That table where nobody will be hungry. Nobody will be on house. The world all around us often uses scientific principles of cause and effect to explain human history, but in Christian experience, tomorrow may be best described today for you and me as followers of Jesus Christ. We could often say the best is yet to come in eternity, but how about living the best now and helping someone else live that best now? How about creating a new eternity for our neighbor, our siblings? When we trust in the promise of God's coming kingdom, we see the signs that even though it's way on the horizon, something's coming. I remember, and I close with this story. I remember um, when my daughters were very young, maybe four or five. One day I was walking home, 
and I parked way down at the end of the street because I wanted to surprise them. And they saw me coming from a distance. I don't know how they picked out. Maybe it was my um, body shape or complexion or something. But they saw, and they started running towards me. They said, Daddy's coming. Well, more than Christmas, hope is coming in your life, your life. Your life, your life, your life, your life, your life, and all of your lives on, on Zoom. Something's coming. And we are not just sitting back waiting for it to come. We are going to be vehicles that help to bring it. What's coming? Hope. What's coming? Joy. What's coming? Peace. What's coming? Love. What's coming? Grace. It's compassion. Peace. Understanding. Uh -huh. I want us to be a part of that group that ushers that in. Not sit back and watch it happen, but be a part of the ones that make it happen. In the lives of those people we touch, we have been blessed to be a blessing. And something's coming. I want us to be a part of making that happen. Let's pray. God, every time a congregation stands up and sings from the heart, come the long expected Jesus, we join Isaiah in the prayer that one day that whole world will indeed walk in the light of the Lord. We celebrate the opportunity to be vehicles used by you to usher in the love of God in the lives of those people we are fortunate to come in contact with. We don't have to sit by to wait for God to do something. Our prayer is that we will be used as vehicles to bring forth God's transformation in the world because something's coming. Amen. Christmas time Comes but once a year Friends and family Full of good cheer Fires burning In each home full of hope Children learning The traditions we know What about the baby? What does he mean? What about the promise? Forever and eternity. He's a ray of hope to us all. Full of love, hear him call. What about the baby? The Savior come to call. Busy lives Moving here and there Trying to find Someone who cares Time slips by The memories fade fast What do we find? A love that will last What about the baby? he mean? What about the promise? Forever in eternity, he's a ray of hope to us all. Full of love, hear his call. What about the baby? The Savior come to call. I believe 
in a love for all time. I claim the promise, the baby is mine. What about the baby? What does he mean? What about the promise? Forever in eternity, he's a ray of hope to us all. Full of love, hear his call. What about the baby? The Savior for us all. Amen. Thank you uh, for your attendance. Thank you for your gifts that you share, your time, your talents. Let's just say a prayer over the offering at this time. Gracious God, we, we come and we're so grateful for the opportunity to give back. Uh, to whom much is given, much is required. And sometimes we give back in um, the use of our gifts to help others. Sometimes we give back in the resources that we have. Sometimes we give back with the time, our precious time, sharing our time with our siblings who are less fortunate than we are. Or maybe it's visiting someone in a hospital or a nursing home or going caroling around someone's home. And whatever gifts that you've given us, thank you for giving us also a heart and a desire to share them. And we ask that in this time of the offering that you will bless those gifts and bless the givers. Um, continue to fill them with your love and your grace that they will share out of their abundance the blessings that you've poured into their life. In Christ's name, amen. amen. I want to offer just a little prayer. Um, so let's pray. This time of year, dear God, it's easy for us to anticipate the, the Christmas tree and the lights and the ornaments and all of that is really amazing and just fun, fills our heart with love and, and hope and joy, anticipation of something coming on December 25th. But we know that over... 2,000 years ago, Christ came in a little baby in a manger that had begun the transformation of our world. And then Christ came and called disciples, followers, those who will imitate his life after he is gone, imitate the love that he shared, imitate the miracles that he performed. As we see those miracles today in modern science and and technology to be able to communicate to thousands of people around the world, to be able to do heart transplants. We see those miracles duplicated today to feed thousands, maybe not with one fish and a loaf of bread, but we're able to feed thousands when we make those decisions to help those who are less fortunate than we are. So we thank you for the gift that came thousands of years ago, but the gift that keeps coming back each year as we celebrate Christmas, as we anticipate something's coming. Continue to use us as instruments, dear God, to extend the love of Jesus Christ in the world. First of all, beginning in our homes, our partners, our spouses, our friends, our neighbors, and then expanding throughout the community, expanding across this nation, and then expanding around the world. That's what we ask, God, that the love that you have tapped our hearts with will overflow into every area that we come in, every person we come in contact with and every place that we go. So many needs, there's still wars, there's still people who are unhoused. There's still people who are being unjustly imprisoned. 
there's still people who are suffering from many illnesses, some for which there are cures, others for which they just maintain a quality of life. There's still people who are breaking up, whether it's the holiday season, the end of year or not. There's still families that are being destroyed by addiction and other destructive behaviors. There's still a lot of people who are hopeless. And so we pray for those who fall into any of those situations that we've described, those who are in the hospital, those who are living with and receiving treatment for cancer. A person who walked in and found out that their partner or friend had walked out, that person who was sentenced to prison because they didn't have proper legal defense, for those people who are giving of their time and energy and putting their life on the line in military and first responders, then in many cases stay awake so that we can sleep at night. For all of our members who are unable to come out and worship with us but worship via Zoom and send their love and their prayers and their offerings and their commitment to this church, for the leadership in this church, for the committed people who come every Sunday or who tune in every Sunday via Zoom. May they experience an overwhelming sense of your presence this season, dear God. And having experienced that, may they share it with others around them. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayers. And so at this time, we're going to thank you, Gerald, for having the mic, and he will pass it around. If you have a prayer request or a praise report, just raise your hand, and he'll bring the mic to you, and then we'll open it up to um, our Zoom family. I just want to remind you that this portion of our worship service will not be recorded to allow people to speak as openly as they want, and so we invite you to offer your prayer request at this time. And whichever version you're comfortable with or familiar with, let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day the daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom in the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it. Then he gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. For you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it for all to drink. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, the new promise the new assurance of my love for you. Do this in remembrance of me. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Sarah, will you assist me, please? May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you. May the Lord look upon you with uh, amazing love and grace and power this week as we go into the final stretch before Christmas. 
May you experience the love of God through this meal, but not experience it in a way where you want to hold it or hoard it for yourself, but experience it in a way that it flows out of you into others that you come in contact. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor each day of this week and grant you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please join us in singing Act Justly. <clears throat> to love and serve the Lord God and one another. Two, three. And just leave, love mercy, walk humbly. Join us. We have some refreshments. There's some cookies back there, and we're going to have some cheese and crackers, too.